Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Fred Borowitz from Yale University for the 43rd Annual Solomon Burson Memorial Award. The Solomon Burson Memorial Lectureship is awarded to a physician, scientist, and researcher who embodies the extraordinary investigative spirit and selflessness of its namesake, Dr. Solomon Burson. The work of Dr. Burson and his longtime friend and colleague, Rosalind Yellow, was the forerunner to modern nuclear medicine. Their collaboration developed a number of groundbreaking antigen assays, including type 2 diabetes, parathyroid hormone, ACTH, and an excretion of growth hormone. Later, this process was adapted as the base measurement for hundreds of other protocols. Neither scientists patented these processes nor profited commercially from their medical and scientific breakthroughs. Dr. Person later served as chair of the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital. He passed away in 1972, and in 1977, Dr. Yellow received the Nobel Prize for their work on the development of radioimmunoassays and peptide hormones. At her request, the laboratory that they shared was designated the Solomon Burson Research Library so that his contributions to our service will be memorialized. And at our speaker, Dr. Gordon received his medical degree from the University of Missouri, where he also completed his training in internal medicine. He completed his fellowship in gastroenterology at Yale. After his clinical training, he began his basic science training at Yale. His later work focused on the mechanisms of acute pancreatitis and how digestive enzymes are activated within the pancreas during this disease. Dr. Borley sees patients with gastrointestinal diseases at the VA Medical Center in West Haven, Connecticut. He's the deputy director for the Yale Physician Scientist Program, and he directs the year-long course for the group that links basic science to clinical disease. His laboratory at the VA studies the molecular mechanisms related to acute pancreatitis with the goal of developing tools that prevent or lessen this disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Borley. Well, <clears throat> first, I would like to thank uh, the department, Francine, Megan, and uh, Jasmine, uh, Jasmine Hernandez, former chief resident, for the invitation uh, to be here today, and really this uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, honor. Um, as Dr. Stewart, one of my former colleagues, uh, pointed out, um, <clears throat> he was surprised this was listed as a new building at Yale. Uh, Andy, actually, they are remodeling the old building to look at a new building to make you feel comfortable should you choose to come back. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> this, these are my uh, disclosures, grant supports from uh, the agencies uh, shown here. They, I should acknowledge uh, at this moment, they will uh, support, supported some of the uh, uh, research that I'm going to be alluding to. I'm on several data safety uh, monitoring boards, as shown here, but have no conflicts directly related to this uh, presentation. Uh, Megan has nicely uh, summarized the achievements of, uh, of Dr. Uh, Beerson. Um, <clears throat> when I was looking through his CV the other day, I, I noticed some interesting uh, similarities, and not revealed on this was that he did not uh, enter medical school, uh, was unable to enter uh, immediately, and took him several years to to be accepted, and uh, in reflection, he's just a couple years younger than my father, who was also in New York City at that time, and for, uh, for reasons they probably shared, uh, he was not admitted uh, either, and uh, Dr. Bearson finally matriculated at NYU. My father ended up, uh, after several years, being accepted in the Midwest in, in St. Louis uh, University, and one of the reasons we, uh, we grew up there. I think especially striking and uh, something that we have all admired and <clears throat> we've heard, heard uh, understand the great achievements of Dr. Beerson has discovery is, uh, is this uh, factor here. And that is uh, <clears throat> upon their discovery of the radioimmunoassay and uh, gaining insight into its value and its potential to, uh, to generate wealth, they declined a patent and I think for those of us who do uh, or act as physician scientists, uh, he really, <clears throat> and their, their efforts, and, and this single act really makes him, I think, a, a hero and a leader and an action that uh, we all uh, aspire to. He, um, his other achievements are listed here, including being the chair here and being elected to the National Academy of Science at a, a very early age. Learning objectives are <clears throat> listed here. We're going to discuss the uh, current etiologies of acute pancreatitis, talk a bit about cellular and molecular mechanisms, new therapeutic approaches. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I 
designed this presentation because I want it to be relevant to, uh, to an audience that's broader than uh, just a gastroenterologist. And that's one of the ways I think about what we're working on and, and uh, as I'll mention, often gain insights into other uh, disease, uh, disease processes. I should mention for the endocrinologists that are here, I will mention insulin in the uh, discussion today and uh, even talk about its relevance to this uh, disease uh, in several points. One of the things that <clears throat> I would like to, uh, to underscore, it's, a, it's one of the facets of the um, <clears throat> presentation, is an understanding that there are cell surface receptors for extracellular molecules and particularly metabolic uh, products. And these are just emerging, have been identified in the last uh, couple of years. And they provide a previously unrecognized mechanism whereby extracellular factors, which we'll touch on in a moment, can, a can account for or stimulate intercellular processes and account for cell-cell communication in ways that were previously not uh, appreciated. Acute pancreatitis uh, is an important uh, disease to, uh, to internists and those in practice. Uh, <clears throat> its uh, incidence is shown there. It's not very common, but for reasons that are not understood, probably in part related to obesity, its, its incidence over the last uh, 15, 20 years has almost uh, doubled. About 20% of those who are admitted will have severe disease, and death in the group with severe disease occurs uh, uh, anywhere up to a, a third of patients. When the <clears throat> uh, burden of disease was, uh, was analyzed uh, in a publication, this is in uh, 2012, it was found that the most common reason for being admitted to the hospital uh, with a GI illness was with the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. Uh, an appreciable cost uh, as far as national uh, health care. And the, the death rates, uh, at least uh, in this period of time, uh, have gone, gone down, 1% uh, of admissions being one of the uh, lowest recorded. So why, why discuss this in the general medicine audience? Well, I think one of the, the things that I would like to, um, to communicate is that this really underscores the opportunity for discovery and for linking disease uh, processes, and I hope that's uh, illuminated as I go through the discussion. Also, I think pancreatitis is important. I mentioned that there's increase in frequency, there's potentially lethal outcomes, and as we'll mention in a moment, there's potentially avoidable or treatable etiologies. I think that the principles that we're going to discuss related to modulation of inflammation will likely be relevant to other forms of acute injury. Um, <clears throat> I think also that it's worth reflecting on the uh, cellular models and the in vivo models that uh, we use. One of the reasons this has become very popular and you'll see people outside gastroenterology explore using these models is it's one of the most reproducible models of acute uh, inflammation, the in vivo studies. We can also test for major effects when a potential therapy is identified. So I'll, I'll uh, review a number of possible interventions and therapeutic agents uh, today based on the research, and one of the questions we have to address is really which would have the, uh, the greatest impact if we are going to try to employ this in clinical studies. Uh, models probably reflect human disease, although we're still in the process of, of answering that uh, question. I have the great fortune of working with a number of uh, wonderful investigators. I've just shown the ones uh, uh, that I work with at uh, Yale. I'll particularly be talking about some of the work that we're doing with Anamica Reed and uh, Gary Desir, uh, also some work on uh, 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 <clears throat> lactate and GPR signaling, primarily from uh, 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 Rafaz uh, Hope. Uh, <clears throat> let me <clears throat> start with looking at a, a patient. This uh, is a patient that was uh, admitted to the hospital and presented uh, uh, to me in one of her affiliate hospitals, a young male, uh, obese, high, history of high triglyceride, had his first bout of pancreatitis. His <clears throat> admission to the emergency room was uh, delayed. He came uh, almost two days after its onset with pain and lethargy. Lethargy's temperature was low, tachycardic. Blood pressure was on the low side. Respiratory rate was on the high side, and he had abdominal guarding. On admission, he had a leukocytosis, elevated BUN and creatinine, and triglycerides were moderately elevated. He was treated <clears throat> on admission uh, with normal saline and half-normal saline, uh, six liters over the first uh, 24 hours. 
Unfortunately, his disease progressed rapidly, had reduced oxygenation. Uh, he had SIRS with multi-organ failure. He was placed on positive uh, end, end pressure, but unfortunately still expired on day four. <clears throat> so this gentleman had uh, several factors we'll talk about that are going to predispose to acute pancreatitis. He was a smoker, obese, had hypertriglyceridemia. Several poor prognostic factors, SEER, SEERs on admission, which persists, an elevated uh, BUN and creatinine. And in the end, we'll come back to him and ask whether changes in his evaluation or treatment might have made a difference in his natural history of the disease. The etiologies of acute pancreatitis uh, are shown here. The biggest part of the pie being accounted for by alcohol and uh, smoking. Uh, is of growing importance and momentarily come back to smoking some of the interesting facets of its effects. Biliary is a <clears throat> uh, equals alcohol and smoking and in causation, but note, note that there's a number of other causes of a <clears throat> acute pancreatitis as shown at the right. And indeed, we should all go through this differential when seeing a patient uh, with uh, uh, with a, acute pancreatitis, even if it seems like they fall well into one of these categories. And that's because so many of these uh, uh, factors in these categories, especially drug-related uh, disease and metabolic, are uh, treatable or uh, avoidable. So acute pancreatitis is a, <clears throat> a sequential process, and consideration of the events in this process affects our thoughts about how we can intervene and when to, when to intervene. It <clears throat> is initiated by uh, one of the types of insults as shown up there. We think one of the primary responses is changes in ASNR cell events, especially calcium signaling, which I'll return to momentarily, causing changes in ASNR cell uh, responses, especially elaboration of uh, inflammatory mediators, stimulating inflammation, causing reductions in blood flow because of their vascular effects, and ultimately leading to cell death. And as I'll point out in a moment, one of the critical uh, components of cell death, and indeed the first cells to die uh, during acute pancreatitis, uh, are fat cells. One of the factors I won't discuss today, and ones that fairly may come up in the discussion, I'm limiting, uh, if you will, our discussion to the first uh, couple of days. And one of the things we need to think about when we're considering uh, interventions is issues to the late events. In other words, how is the pancreas reconstituted and rebuilt? Whether some of these early ma manifestations may affect, um, may affect uh, infectious complications. And in that context, the issue of uh, late islet uh, failure. So something that's been realized only in the last couple of years uh, is the fact that uh, we patients with acute pancreatitis develop diabetes rather frequently. Previously, we <clears throat> thought that virtually everybody either succumb, would succumb to their disease or would uh, recover entirely. And first shown in 2014 and now documented by several subsequent studies is that over time, about a third of patients who've had acute pancreatitis will develop uh, diabetes and islet, uh, islet uh, failure. Interestingly, this appears to occur independent of the severity, and its mechanism is not understood. Some fascinating studies recently that I'm not going to go into showing a relationship between primary islet failure and the uh, exocrine pancreas, which I'll touch on right in the end. But this is islet cell failure after a bout of acute pancreatitis, so something patients should be uh, followed for. So one of the themes that I would uh, <clears throat> like to, to emphasize is that <clears throat> many of these uh, factors act in uh, concert, and they require other factors, which I'm going to designate as sensitizers to either cause disease or as uh, modulators of, of severity. And that's really the backdrop for the uh, discussion and the topics that I'm going to uh, touch on uh, as we go through the different uh, uh, mechanisms of disease and uh, contributors. So <clears throat> here's examples of uh, sensitizers uh, that, that affect uh, the risk of developing disease or modulating severity, and we're going to go through these uh, some of them briefly and how we think about them from a mechanistic standpoint and then how also we might approach this uh, treatment or therapy. So obesity is known to increase the risk of the disease and risk of getting severe disease. Cigarette smoking uh, increases disease uh, risk. 
Acidosis predicts severity in, uh, of pancreatitis and diabetic ketoacidosis and worsens experimental pancreatitis. Lactate <coughs> containing lactated ringers appears to be better than normal saline when used as the primary uh, intravenous uh, support. And renal failure increases the risk of getting disease and uh, of developing uh, a severe disease. And we're going to touch on, on each of these. <clears throat> we emphasize that the interest of our laboratory is on the pancreatic ASNR cell responses, but I think in acknowledgement of the complexity of the disease, realize that there's a, um, a, a very complex communication that reinforces the, the process of injury. So we'll touch on parts of this, uh, especially with fat cells and uh, some with these other types of cells, but there's crosstalk where they're signaling from an injured ASNR cell to inflammatory cells and then signaling back to the ASNR cell. Uh, important stimulation of nerves, particularly the process of neurogenic inflammation, signals coming uh, from uh, the ASNR cell that affect vascular permeability, decreased uh, blood flow. So the, while the ASNR cells may initiate disease, these interactions with other cell types is important for perpetuation of disease and determinants of uh, severity, and makes studying the disease and understanding it, I think, much more complex. Uh, this is sort of the bread and butter of what we've done in the uh, laboratory over the years. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, but this just contrasts what happens with normal physiologic uh, stimulation of the ASNR cell and induction of pancreatitis uh, events. Amongst the most critical responses is the generation of activated digestive enzymes within the ASNR cell. Here we show the appearance of the trypsinogen activation peptide uh, upon induction of uh, pancreatitis. Uh, inhibition of secretion, increases in paracellular permeability, disordered autophagy, in limited <coughs> elaboration of inflammatory mediators, and, and basal lateral uh, secretion. So a number of things go wrong. We think many of these are, are key to specific uh, sig signaling abnormalities, some of which I'll touch on momentarily. So obesity has been noted to be an important factor for, for pancreatitis uh, risk and severity. Uh, this reflects data from uh, one of the more recent uh, st uh, studies, this uh, study in 2013, and showing both for men and for women increasing <coughs> amounts of uh, abdominal obesity measured by abdominal girth increases the relative risk of getting uh, disease. Indeed, <coughs> we are now referring to this uh, process as metabolic uh, uh, pancreatitis because one also sees excess abdominal fat, elevated triglycerides, and high glucose levels uh, grouped together in the same patients. And together, in aggregate, they, <clears throat> they represent a, uh, factors that increase the, uh, the role of uh, or <clears throat> the risk of getting uh, acute pancreatitis or a severe disease, and are included in some of the uh, uh, prognostic uh, evaluations. We'll mention that abdominal fat appears to be uh, the most important, and the role of insulin secretion in this uh, context is unknown. So <clears throat> in an elegant study done by um, uh, Vijay uh, Singh's group published in Translational Medicine, this done while he was at uh, Pittsburgh, uh, showed <clears throat> a fascinating interaction between ASNR cells and intrapancreatic uh, fat cells. And that is that <clears throat> signals traveling from an injured ASNR cell go to the fat cell they stimulate uh, fat cell injury, the release of triglycerides that are then hydrolyzed. They generate free fatty acids. Free fatty acids go back and injure the ASNR cell and set up an uh, <clears throat> important uh, loop of injury. So this is probably one of the more critical factors um, in, in pancreatitis initiation, an important determinant of severity, and, and gives, <clears throat> gives us greater appreciations for the uh, the small amounts of fat that we sometimes see uh, in our pancreas and the fact they represent the site of first detectable injury. Alcohol has long been linked to the <clears throat> pathogenesis uh, etiology of acute pancreatitis. This is a classic uh, data from Durbarik and Sarles showing a, <clears throat> a relative uh, concentration uh, dependence of alcohol and the percent of patients developing acute pancreatitis. Note, you have to be a, an abuser. These are grams per day for 10 years to make it onto this uh, graph. So 
uh, you can enjoy your weekend uh, at least without fear of getting into trouble uh, unless you <coughs> fill your weekdays with similar activities. Um, <coughs> so it's clear that alcohol, based on the fact that, that and this in experimental models is low percent, that it's a sensitizer. It does not primarily cause disease. Factors that we know act with it to cause disease, other sensitizers, include specific uh, mutational changes in CFTR, minor mutations that did not cause, uh, cause CF, SPINK, the pancreatic trypsin inhibitor, and uh, most recently, Claudin-2, all uh, act in concert with alcohol to increase the risk of disease, and <clears throat> as we alluded to, uh, when combined with uh, smoking. So one of the most recently recognized uh, etiologies of <clears throat> acute uh, and chronic pancreatitis has been smoking. There's been hints that, uh, a, that smoking could lend to the pathogenesis of chronic disease for a number of years, but very recently, beginning about uh, 10 years ago, realization it could contribute to, uh, <clears throat> to acute disease. And this is a summary of data from one of the studies plotting in the green acute, in the blue chronic, and showing as you had increased amounts of smoke ingestion, there's an increased risk of developing both acute and chronic pancreatitis. This <clears throat> seems to act as an independent uh, factor uh, mechanistically, even by the epidemiologic uh, studies, uh, independent of alcohol and stones. And so the fact that it was independent was one of the reasons we have uh, began uh, looking at this to try to understand its etiology and sort of, I will give you the, uh, <clears throat> the bottom line as we understand it. We think one of the major toxins in cigarette smoke is a metabolite of nicotine called NN, uh, NNK, a nitrosylated uh, form of the molecule that's generated thermally in cigarette smoking. Unfortunately, we can also do this in our liver. Um, my bet is people can do it to different uh, degrees. So this particular compound has been strongly implicated in, uh, and linked to uh, the cancer-causing effects of uh, uh, smoking, and we think it may well also be linked to its pancreatitis effects. So it does something very interesting. This conversion generates a form of the molecule, uh, this NNK form, that's a very potent agonist for cell surface receptors, particularly this non-neural uh, nicotinic or uh, receptor, nicotinic receptor found on non-neural systems called the alpha-7. And so over the short term, it can cause injury to the pancreas. Over the long term, our very recent uh, publications, we'll mention in a moment, Dr. Seed suggests that <clears throat> it has uh, profound effects on thiamine uh, uh, metabolism, and that may be one of the major mechanisms of uh, toxicity. Notably, we concentrated in the pancreas the highest levels reported three uh, micromolar, and that's particularly relevant since the KD for this receptor is the 20 nanomolar range, suggesting that uh, in heavy smokers, you can certainly likely activate these pathways. Uh, I'm going to try to show very little data today, primary data, but just because I thought this was rather fascinating. Uh, this is work we're doing with Dr. Saeed, some of the very recent publications on this, showing chronic exposure of the cigarette toxin reduces <coughs> thiamine transporters um, in, uh, <coughs> in the pancreas, and there are two cell surface thiamine uh, transporters, one on the mitochondria, and indeed it uh, decreases uh, all three of, uh, of these uh, transporters. Notably, we also found that the transporters are decreased in the heart and the brain, and I think this raises questions if, uh, if, uh, if, there, if there may be other forms of toxicity in these organs uh, that are related to changes in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, thiamine uh, transport. As I mentioned on the other side, thiamine is a key factor in, in regulating mitochondrial function, and preliminary data suggests that mitochondrial function and ER stress also occurs in, uh, in, <clears throat> in animals exposed to these uh, toxins, including smoking. So now I'm going to go to a, a couple of ex other extracellular factors, some which I think have uh, potential therapeutic value. The ones we're going to talk about are lactate acting on uh, macrophages, uh, which are going to secondarily act on ASNR cells, uh, <clears throat> a newly discovered uh, circulating uh, hormone called renalase, Oof, that was mine, and um, also the generation of uh, proteins. We're going to focus on calcium signaling. Um, some questions may come up about these other factors we've identified as important in pancreatitis, but we're going to, uh, I think, restrict the focus uh, today. 
And uh, <clears throat> these are related to autophagy and elaboration of inflammatory mediators, but I'm, we're not going to go into the details of those effects unless they come up in question. And some of the, <clears throat> what I want to uh, underscore in the next couple of slides, and this is an example of how extracellular factors can act on cell surface receptors to affect uh, responses. In this case, we're going to talk how lactate, discuss how lactate actually acts uh, <clears throat> to, through a G protein uh, linked receptor to regulate uh, inflammatory uh, responses, rather unexpected finding, and also how renalase is acting on a plasma membrane calcium extrusion pathway to regulate uh, injury, uh, injury responses. So we think that <clears throat> one of the responses that occurs early in acute pancreatitis, although challenging to document directly, is <clears throat> a drop in pancreatic pH and localized uh, acidosis. And <clears throat> the origins of that probably come from decreased uh, oral intake, volume depletion, uh, a vascular leak, indeed permeability throughout the body, including gut endothelial cells, rapidly changing acute pancreatitis for reasons we do not understand, and vasoconstriction. And this is uh, from a study done in Japan, and they saw this in a number of their patients where they're doing arteriograms in the first couple of hours of acute pancreatitis. And one can see if they're up close that there's pruning uh, of a number of the, uh, uh, the arterioles and small arteries and vasoconstriction. And this seems to be a very uh, prominent feature of uh, acute pancreatitis in the early phases of the disease. Shown here are studies from uh, UCLA uh, in a model of uh, <clears throat> chronic, animal model chronic pancreatitis. And you can see even in the resting state uh, in this model, the uh, parenchymal pHs are below uh, around 7, 7.2, and when one induces pancreatitis, they, uh, they fall further. So I propose that there's localized uh, acidosis occurs due, due to decreased uh, blood flow in the, uh, the pancreas, although not really directly documented. So what, how could that be important in this uh, disease process? So one of the things I think that we've, we fail to uh, explore uh, fully in our mind's eye is the importance of acidosis on cellular responses. Um, <clears throat> for those, if they're neurologists uh, in the crowd, uh, we understand that nerves are, are very well endowed with different acid uh, sensing uh, mechanisms that affect uh, cell signaling. Uh, they're <clears throat> linked to pathways that are involved in, in pain responses and what we we'll call neurogenic inflammation, stimulation of neurotransmitters, particularly linked to inflammatory responses. Uh, <clears throat> acid uh, can also affect a low pH environment activation of uh, particular types of inflammatory cells and sensitization to, uh, to activation. They can also affect epithelial cells, they affect paracellular permeability, and I'll show you as, uh, signaling in a moment. So this is just among the different potential targets of uh, acid that one needs to think about and, and consider, and I think that the discussion relating to uh, the effects of low pH is, in my mind, likely, likely relevant to uh, low pH uh, situations in, in other disease uh, processes. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about the effects of, uh, of uh, extracellular pH and, uh, <clears throat> on pancreatitis. Um, I thought I, I was going to go through on each one of these and, and tell you why we started looking at them in some detail. So this, I decided, is the only one that I'm going to tell you about because after a while it's a little embarrassing, but this is, uh, Andy will, <coughs> Stuart will appreciate the uh, serendipity in this. So a uh, quote by James Joyce, mistakes the portals of discovery, and certainly this accounts for that. So I was preparing a clinical talk about 10 years ago and I saw an article by Dr. Pichmoni from New York, and looking at the data, it suggested that the pH uh, of the patient at the time of admission would predict whether or not they're going to develop uh, <clears throat> pancreatitis with DKA and its severity, and a subsequent study really aimed at this has substantiated that. We also had, it turned out we had a faulty pH meter in our laboratory, and <clears throat> it, uh, we were using a TRIS buffer, and over time it degraded, and what happened was our assays for pancreatitis stopped working, and we spent months trying to figure out what it was, and we finally figured out what this was the cause, and <clears throat> that insight um, led us to understand that extracellular pH within a very narrow range could regulate 
uh, pancreatitis responses. So we started looking at this. The first study we published was here in gastroenterology, and this showed that using cellular models and an in vivo model and an acid load induce indeed worsened uh, pancreatitis. And so we started looking in more detail, trying to understand that. I'm not going to go through this study, but I'd, I'd show one slide that had real data. We actually do some experiments in the laboratory. And here we looked at to see whether it affects this primary response of calcium signaling, pH uh, 7, 4 versus 7 on all these. And we think this represents a, a representative physiologic uh, to pathologic excursion of pH. And basically what we found was that we would change physiologic calcium signaling in the cell to pathologic or pancreatitis signaling just by dropping the pH. And we also found that this was due to release of calcium through a particular ER calcium channel called the ryanidine receptor. Still trying to understand exactly mechanistically how that's happening. And this shows <clears throat> that if we look at other measures of pancreatitis, other readouts such as activation of digestive enzymes, release of lactic hydrogenase or morphologic injury. In each case, we would sensitize the system as shown by the uh, purple arrow and <clears throat> by dropping the pH. And in each case, if we added an inhibitor, the ryanidine uh, receptor, we would uh, reverse this. So this is, we think, one of the important mechanisms of how a low pH environment can change cell signaling and en enhance uh, injury. We uh, also found another response that I think was quite interesting and informative and I think likely applies to other epithelial cells. And this was an effect on gap junctions. So remember gap junctions are <coughs> uh, trans conduits that couple cells, adjoining cells. They have molecular weight cut off of a thousand important for intracellular communication. The dominant uh, 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 <coughs> gap junction protein in the Astner cell is connexin 32. There's some 26 also. Uh, we know from studies from others that genetic deletion of the connexon leads to much worse pancreatitis, suggesting that it has some effect in modulating disease. Acidification in calcium can reduce gap junction conductance and that these have high, uh, high turnover rates. And so we question whether these changes in pH are <coughs> um, outside the cell could, uh, <clears throat> could regulate uh, the gap junction function. And I'll sort of give you the bottom line on quite a bit of uh, data. As we lower pH, you indeed over that range dramatically decrease uh, coupling uh, between Essner cells. We also dramatically increase the degradation rate of connexons. So for plasma membrane protein, these proteins have tr unbelievably high turnover rates, 15 to 20 minutes. And what was really interesting too at pH 7.4, this is degraded by <clears throat> it's called a proteasomal pathway, cytoplasmic pathway. As you change the pH, you, you drop, you totally change the mechanism of degradation and move it into a lysosomal uh, dominant uh, pathway. Uh, <clears throat> we don't know exactly why this worsens pancreatitis. Uh, we think that mechanistically it, it may result from so something called a hemichannel where these channels uh, will break in half and some remain open. And that is now being recognized as an important factor in driving inflammatory responses. So <clears throat> these are, uh, this slide probably has changed uh, very little over the last 20 years, highlights the primary treatments in uh, acute uh, pancreatitis. And <clears throat> although there's a number of things listed here, the mainstay of treatment is still the aggressive administration of fluid and uh, electrolytes. Here are the uh, <clears throat> current uh, recommendations, which I think are important and are undergone uh, recent uh, evolutionary change. Some of these re re <clears throat> recommendations that I have here are still based on preliminary data. I think some important uh, data is going to be coming out of a prospective study at USC uh, to, uh, to support this. But I think data would suggest that rapid early uh, intravenous fluid support uh, is in, <clears throat> important uh, in, in altering the natural history of the disease and improving it. And we advocate starting this in the emergency room. It appears that even for those with mild to moderate disease, there's benefit. There's also data suggesting that beginning at the end of an ERCP will reduce the incidence of post-ERCP pancreatitis. Uh, <clears throat> there is evidence that there's a lack of benefit when given late or after the onset of SEERS. Also, some concerning uh, data suggesting going over 
four and a half liters per day on the first day is associated with increased incidence of pulmonary uh, complications and death. And some preliminary evidence suggesting that if you <clears throat> subtend this uh, into avoiding giving patients uh, with who would be susceptible to overload um, <clears throat> uh, in these categories here, you can go up to uh, six and a half liters per day with uh, no uh, detrimental, uh, detrimental effects. So one question uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, is of interest is whether the IV fluid composition could affect outcomes. So when I started looking at this, I found it, and I still find it absolutely remarkable that virtually <clears throat> uh, no studies have been done asking the question, does the type of uh, intravenous fluid make any difference in a clinical response? And not that it's an easy, they're easy studies to do, but uh, there are very, very little data on this. So these are standard buffers. They're in the ED and in uh, ICUs, normal saline, lactated ringers. I've circled some things that might have untoward effect. Note, note that the pH of normal saline is around 5.3. Glass bottle it, it down in the low fours. Uh, <clears throat> lactated ringers, pH on average is higher. It contains lactate. Uh, it also contains calcium, which may or may not be such a good idea in acute pancreatitis. So <clears throat> we've mentioned some of the uh, sensitizing factors, including acidic uh, pH, ex high extracellular calcium. We didn't talk about hyponatremia, but it probably is also. And <clears throat> a, we had done a preliminary study showing that uh, lactated ringers is, is superior to normal saline, even when this is pH'd up in the uh, cerulean, uh, cerulean uh, model. So this is the major data we have now to make the recommendations. This is a prospective study done by Beach and Wu, a heroic study in my mind on 40 patients with severe pancreatitis. And <clears throat> looking at responses in those given lactate ringers or normal saline, so one can appreciate measuring inflammatory responses, CRP, uh, or decreases in Sears score, one does uh, much better in uh, lactated ringers. Uh, a question is whether lactated ringers is, is being, bringing uh, the benefit or, or normal saline is uh, just detrimental. It's probably a combination of the uh, two. So why should lactate uh, <clears throat> be beneficial? And we started looking at that question in detail. And as we were looking at it, a group at uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson identified a GPR uh, called GPR81 that was a lactate receptor, studied it in the context of, of responses in fat cells. And the responses in, that, in those cell types are somewhat different. So we, um, in this paper here by Rafaz Hogue, started looking at lactate and saying, uh, how could it be acting? Uh, to, to suppress inflammatory responses. And we use uh, in that paper models, three models of acute hepatitis and also models of uh, uh, pancreatitis. And I'm showing you um, just some, in this case, some of the hepatitis, hepatitis data. And here we induced uh, a severe, this in case was severe hepatitis and this is administration of exogenous lactate. We can see by transaminase values, greatly protective. We then went back and we really dialed back on the injury in this model so it, it barely would give you any injury. And you can see in those with very mild injury, here's the survival curve here. Then we knocked down the receptor in the liver and we turned this non-lethal injury into a lethal injury. And to me, this was one of the most dramatic experiments I think I've ever been involved in. And what it tells me is that endogenous lactate production acting through GPR81, this is endogenous lactate reduction, can reduce acute injuries. And I think it, for me, provided a very different way about thinking about the production of lactate and how we measure it as a marker of, uh, of injury and what it, uh, what it may be uh, doing. So we think <clears throat> what's happening is, uh, based on other data, that injury in the, into the cell is uh, stimulating, of the Asner cell is, is stimulating release of factors that are stimulating uh, TL, TLRs, uh, predominantly TLR9, and <clears throat> activating uh, macrophages and inflammasome. And <clears throat> lactate, for reasons we don't uh, mechanistically fully understand uh, the, the total innovation pathway, through GPR81 shuts down this uh, transmission.
or uh, this activation and suppresses uh, inflammation. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the important uh, summary is that metabolic intermediates, and I'll mention a couple others, can reduce injury in acute uh, pancreatitis. So one of the, I think, important um, conclusions of the presentation today and things that I think going forward for you that are involved in this to, to think about is that there's a host of GPRs now that have been uh, <clears throat> uh, defined as sensitive to cytosolic factors and responding to, uh, to ions as shown here, zinc, calcium, and protons that can be involved in inflammatory response. I've shown you data for lactate. We also have data for beta-hydroxybutyrate and succinate. And also enzymes can, can affect the activity of GPRs that are linked to cellular responses that are ultimately linked uh, to modulation of uh, inflammation. So <clears throat> I'd like to end up with a, um, some studies which I find are exciting and fascinating, been done largely with uh, our colleague Gary Vizier, who just became chief of medicine at uh, Yale, one of uh, <clears throat> Dr. Stewart and I's running partners uh, when he was in New Haven. And this is a protein called uh, uh, renalase. And uh, the, I have to say, as, as things go forward on this, it's another one of the uh, <clears throat> studies that we're doing now is that at every step, step kind of amazes me what we're finding and discovering about uh, how, this, uh, how this works. So Gary found this as a serum protein that disappears in chronic renal failure doing proteomics. And his theory was, hypothesis is that something might disappear from the serum that uh, is linked to the, the, uh, the phenotype of chronic uh, pancreatitis. And indeed, it does mediate some of, those, uh, some of those effects, which I'm not going to go into. In the course of his studies, he found that it functions as a potent cellular survival factor. So that, that's going to be one, one reason we started looking at this. There's also reasons to consider chronic renal failure in the context of pancreatitis. So it's known that if you have chronic renal failure, your risk of getting acute pancreatitis is prominently increased, and your risk of get, developing severe pancreatitis is also increased. Um, so it's also, Gary, shown recently that exogenous recombinant renalase reduces acute uh, uh, renal and cardiac injury, and that acute injury is uh, seen in acute pancreatitis because renalase is primarily made in the kidney. We, also theorize that it, its levels may decrease uh, in this disease. So we've taken a look at this, and I'm not going to show you the details of the uh, data, uh, which Anamica has just uh, submitted. But basically, in cell models of uh, a pancreatitis, we find that recombinant renalase reduces injury prominently. In vivo, if we delete the protein, when uh, the animal model gets much worse pancreatitis, and exogenous renalase is protective after the onset of disease. So in working with Gary, we, it, we looked, asked how is it acting in the cell. We, we identified as its major protein this plasma membrane calcium pump, going to be involved in, in calcium extrusion, and found that it enhances extrusion from the cell. So I'm not going to go through the data on this, but this is how we look at rates of extrusion from the Asner cell, Dr. Reed's data. Uh, <clears throat> this just is quantitation of it. And if we block uh, the calcium uh, extrusion mechanism with a, a peptide called caloxone, we reverse this effect. And indeed, if um, we if we reverse the effect, we reverse the, the beneficial effects of, uh, on, um, on uh, pancreatitis. So uh, for those endocrinologists in the crowd, and I think unrecognized are papers that started coming out about three years ago, Showing the bottom line is that insulin has almost an identical effect. They have not yet identified the plasma membrane, the PMCA that it's acting on, but causes calcium extrusion. Uh, <clears throat> it uh, protects the cell, in this case against ATP depletion. Uh, it also activates uh, AKT, and we find also uh, we get AKT uh, activation. One of the things we're looking at is seeing whether um, how these might be acting uh, in, uh, in concert. An important <clears throat> uh, anatomical relationship underscores the potential importance of the uh, islet cells to the exocrine pancreas, and that is it's one of the three portal systems in, the, um, in our bodies, and that is that high concentrations of insulin can reach, uh, reach the Asner cells. And it's known in acute pancreatitis, this process is uh, disabled. Uh, 
And <clears throat> it's possible that decreases in insulin secretion uh, acting uh, by failure to activate uh, calcium extrusion might also uh, amplify uh, disease. So one of the other features of, of renal ACE that we found uh, uh, interesting and important is, is shown here. I mentioned the fact that it's produced uh, largely in the kidney but in other tissues. And shown here are serum levels of renal ACE after the induction of acute pancreatitis at time zero. This is uh, the period of ongoing disease. You can see there's a very prominent uh, decrease in renal ACE levels in our animal model. Uh, <clears throat> we stop inducing disease here. It starts to recover by 12 hours, and you can see there's a rebound in these uh, levels. Um, <clears throat> we have some preliminary data done with a group in uh, Germany, prospectively uh, collected serum patients admitted to the hospital with pancreatitis. And, and this is data from 24 hours after onset. And we can see that in uh, age match controls, compared to them, there's a decrease in the levels of uh, renal ACE in, in those admitted for pancreatitis. So <clears throat> with a clinical group at, uh, at Yale, we're evaluating whether serum renal ACE levels can have uh, a value in, in <clears throat> acute pancreatitis and also might be able to uh, predict those who would get post-ERCP-induced disease. Briefly, coming back to our uh, patient, a uh, number of factors that, <clears throat> that altered a, a poor prognosis, including serous on admission, um, elevated BUN and uh, creatinine. So <clears throat> are there things that we might have done differently? Well, you can see that somehow when he came in the ED, he had a contrast CT. We probably should not be doing these in the first day or so of acute pancreatitis. He was a couple of days out. The reason we avoid them is that uh, <clears throat> there's evidence that contrast CT early in the course of the disease can actually worsen the disease. Whether it made his disease worse uh, or not, I don't know, but uh, they probably could have made the diagnosis of uh, <laughs> acute uh, pancreatitis without getting a contrast study. And there's actually nothing we do when we see this finding now. Uh, this started to be a practice uh, in the 90s, 1990s because of the use of antibiotics, but we no longer follow that paradigm. So the types of fluids and amount of the fluid. So we've talked about <clears throat> uh, the benefits of lactated bringers. So we had the option, probably would have gone to, uh, to normal saline. We probably would have used uh, less fluids than they uh, used here. However, this patient already had the onset of Sears. So in reality, uh, the fluids that were administered at this time probably would not have made a great difference in his outcome, the type of fluids, but certainly the amounts, uh, the amounts uh, could have. He <clears throat> developed respiratory failure, was given PEEP appropriately. One of the possibilities is that um, he could have been supported by uh, plasmapheresis, which is uh, useful in hypertriglyceridemic uh, pancreatitis. Whether it had been helpful at a level of 600 is unclear, but in somebody who is going downhill, I certainly would have uh, considered that <clears throat> modality if, if available. So to summarize um, the topics that we've uh, talked about today, I'll just start at the top right and go around. We talked about renal ACE as a circulating factor that acts through a calcium pump that <clears throat> relieves uh, acute injury that's calcium dependent, probably by calcium extrusion, although it may affect other signaling pathways. We talked about how protons <clears throat> work to uh, cause cell damage by changing calcium signaling, specific patterns of calcium release, also disassembling uh, or interrupting gap junctions that might result in the formation of what we call hemichannels. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about how cigarette smokes might uh, factors that may contribute uh, to the development of acute and chronic pancreatitis acting through specific nicotinic receptors uh, and affecting thiamine metabolism and mitochondrial function. I haven't talked about zinc, but <clears throat> uh, zinc may be also very important, also acting through uh, a, a GPR called GPR39, and spent some time talking about how lactate is not only a marker of decreased uh, perfusion, but probably an important inherent uh, uh, modulator of an, uh, inflammatory uh, processes. So I'd like to close with a, a few uh, final thoughts. Um, I hope I've conveyed uh, <clears throat> the message that uh, one can look at one pathologic uh, system and extrapolate to others and think about uh, how this might affect other systems. And I think that's one of the most important messages today.
And so <clears throat> my first conclusion is that I think biologics, uh, biologic responses and pathologic responses are often conserved. And one of the things that I strive to do is really learn from other systems and apply those to the system that I'm interested in. So if you look at <clears throat> what I, uh, my, my work for a, more than a decade, and uh, at least my early time at Yale, it was not really clinically r related. And one of the things I've learned, especially in the last 10 years, is that really good science can be clinically relevant. And it becomes much more exciting to me when you can couple it to, to disease and potential therapeutic interventions. So I think it's very important. I've learned from patients, and I've learned from clinical challenges. And, and come to appreciate that it's very important to, you know, question dogma and question accepted practice. And it actually probably does make a difference when you're reaching up in the ICU to grab a bottle of normal saline or one of lactated ringers, which one you're, which one you're pulling off the shelf. And so I think that we all need to take a part in, uh, in further knowledge. That's one of our obligations as, as being a physician, as being physician uh, scientist or scientist and also realizing that we're privileged uh, to be in the special position that we are to, uh, to further this process. So with that, I would like to, uh, to thank you all and uh, be happy to take some questions. Uh, were you able to distinguish or separate the beneficial effect of lactate from its pH or uh, acid-base uh, consequences? I think we were in, um, so what happened was we, we had some difficulties. We, we buffered, first of all, we buffered it in solution and still had the effect. The second is when we we're looking at its beneficial effects, we knocked out its receptor and knocking out the receptor eliminated its beneficial effects. So I need to qualify that statement, okay? And so the qualifiers are this. We, we go for the, we found the ideal blood levels to obtain resting levels or, you know, anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3 millimolar. The levels of therapeutic efficacy are around uh, 2 to 4 millimolar. We get high levels, which you can sometimes find it starts appearing to have untoward effects. We don't know whether that's due to its, its acid carrying effects or the fact that it's hitting some of these other GPRs. And I actually think it may be the fact that it's hitting other GPRs that, that sense these metabolic intermediates. Uh, that gentleman's photo, uh, talking about a very lovable person. Uh, so many of us uh, were lucky to work with him. He was driving an old car in Roslyn, Long Island as a general practitioner when he decided he wanted to do full-time science and got a job in the basement of the VA in the Bronx and then came the Nobel Prize ideas. So that's a lovely little anecdote. Uh, the other thing is when I arrived here as an intern resident uh, a few years ago, uh, we, had a, uh, we had a pancreas expert, David Dryling. He was a surgeon who had a, a tremendous focus on getting the fluid from the pancreas, even though we had no imaging studies that could see the pancreas. And other than the Levine tube, he would just patiently get fluid and do his studies. His collaborator was um, the famous GI uh, inflammatory bowel disease guy. Uh, Mm -hmm. Hey, how are you talking? Hey, how are you? Hey, how no, are you? No, Dr. Dryling. It's a long story of, of Dr. Dryling doing a lot of great work for us in pancreas with patients that was remarkable. One last question. Um, I'm wondering, uh, given the thiamine deficiency that's often seen in chronic alcoholics, if you wonder, is that one explanation perhaps for the overlap of alcohol and smoking given the effect of NNK on thiamine metabolism as being one explanation perhaps for seeing alcohol and smoking affecting acute pancreatitis. But secondly, are there any data to show whether thiamine administration in vitro mitigates any of this effect? So that's a great question. So the question is this, the, um, so we show that with, with uh, Dr. Saeed that the transporters are all down and 
we're, it looks like that's a selective effect of stimulation this pathway. As I mentioned, that's receptor that's mediated by the alpha 7 nicotinic receptor. In the knockout, we don't see that effect. It seems to be, as I mentioned, if we look at other message mRNAs, um, <clears throat> they are not affected, so it's not a generalized effect. And there is a, a master regulator of those three genes, and the regulation doesn't seem to be at that point. But, <clears throat> And we don't know the answer to your question. We're going to do the experiment. But what happens is that the transport of thiamine into the cell and into the mitochondria is dramatically reduced. And I didn't show it, but it's about a third of normal. And the question is, if we gave exogenous thiamine, would we be able to drive it in? And we don't know that, but it's a very important question because uh, it does change the way one would think about uh, therapy and the chances for success for therapy, if this is the case. I think I agree with you. I think that when in the alcoholic, it's a combination of effects. If you have a drinker and a smoker, there's decreased dietary thiamine intake, and there's also going to be inhibition of transport, and those two are going to amplify the, the uh, deficiency. Great. Let's thank Dr. Gordon.